Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I'll be chatting with Kevin Tedeschi all about the Akashic Records. He's been a longtime studier of Edgar Casey. Let me go ahead and read his bio really quick before we get started. Kevin J. Tedeschi, M.A., served in a variety of positions with Edgar Casey's A.R.E. for nearly 40 years before retiring as executive director and CEO. A popular speaker, he has lectured on six continents to thousands of individuals. A prolific writer, he is the author of more than 25 books, including Edgar Casey on the Akashic Records, Edgar Casey on Reincarnation and Family Karma, and Edgar Casey on Mastering Your Soul Growth, a nationally recognized source on the interpretations of dreams. He has also written The Best Dream Book Ever and Dreams, Images, and Symbols, which examines more than 2,500 dream images and symbols and 10,000 interpretations. His books can be found at kevindoteshi.com. Kevin, welcome to the show. Liz, thanks for having me on the program. Super excited to have you on here chatting with us. I found you um, through ARE, listened to a couple of your things there, and then I just listened to um, one of your talks on Akashic Records on Journey Within, and it was really great. I've listened to it three times. It's it, fantastic. It's a fascinating topic. It really is. Yeah. It is. So I'm excited to dive in. So why don't you go ahead and share what are the Akashic Records for people who might not know? Well, uh, the Akashic Records, the word comes from the Hindu word Akasha, which basically means boundless space. And the idea from Casey's perspective is that's where he got his information most of the time. Uh, he believed there was this etheric force field, let's say, around the earth, and that every thought, every word, every deed that anyone ever did in the history of the world was written in these Akashic Records, and he could tune into that. And as amazing as that sounds, uh, I'm sure most of your listeners have heard about a near-death experience where when someone dies, they have kind of like a life review and they see their whole life pass before them and then they're awakened and they don't actually go all the way to the other side. Well, that life review is really the process of tuning into your own Akashic records. So some people are aware of the fact that it's a record of everything your soul has ever done, but it's not just a database. It's also interactive in that it draws to us the people, the activities, the events, the experiences, the relationships that we need for our own soul growth and development. And it's constantly calculating probabilities that, you know, I used to, I often say, if Kevin does this, here's the outcome. If Kevin does this, here's the outcome. So the Akashic records are often calculating those probabilities in order to bring to us exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. That's a quick wow. So our life isn't set in stone. We have to, I always picture like we sit down, we kind of plan out our life before we come down here. And then the Akashic records, as you say, are full of possibilities and probabilities and different directions. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. The Agricasarines use the, uh, the phrase that we're really co-creators with the divine in our life's unfoldment, that you know, we, we really help to move the direction our life is going to go. And one of the examples I often give is, you know, two people can have the very same experience. And I often say, for example, the loss of a job. And the way you respond to that experience really helps to co-create what comes next. So if you've been with a company for 30 years and you became really upset and angry and you go down one track of dealing with this and someone else, let's say they had the same experience and they think, wow, this will give me the opportunity to do whatever I want to do. So it's not life experiences that create the life we lead. It's how we respond to those experiences. And so we really create our life one choice, one decision, one response at a time. And uh, I think in part, that's why Casey often talked about the importance of having a spiritual ideal to help guide your life's unfoldment, because the more we do things in accord with our best self, the better our own life experience will be. And lots of times when I've done a program all over, people will say, you will know, why did this horrible, almost unimaginable thing happen to me? And, and very often it's because a soul chooses to be able to help someone else with the very same experience or a, chore, a soul volunteers to be uh, helpful to someone else who underwent that experience. So we do pick our life experiences and how we respond to whatever we pick from the offset is what helps to create what we're living right now. Wow, that's amazing. 
God, and that really is the case too. When something happens to us, it's really our response to it that really guides the direction that our life goes in. I've realized that over the 52 years of my life, that my decisions have a great impact on the direction that my life is going in. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, there, there have definitely been times in my own life when I've asked, you know, what, what is going on here? Why is this happening? And I remember once uh, when I was having a very challenging experience in a relationship, I went outside to the uh, parking lot and I'm standing next to my car and I, I just said aloud, why, why is this happening to me? And I, I honestly, I heard a woman's voice in my ear whisper to learn how to have control of yourself when you have no control over the external experience. And I thought, I mean, honestly, my first thought was, wow, that's a great way to learn that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying I've learned it yet, but it is an interesting, it, it is interesting how everything can be a learning experience. Wow. It really is, isn't it? Life is a journey and it learning is a journey, experience. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's not written in stone and we have all of these different directions that we can go and life is more sort of a blank page than set in stone, is there such a thing as getting off our divine plan? I think there are uh, ways we can mess up, uh, absolutely. But what, what, what I have, in looking at the Edgar Casey readings and all the people who had past life readings, and there was about 1900 of them, and then just reflecting on my own life's journey, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, when you do things in accord with your plan or when you do things in accord with spirit, the universe is going to give you much greater parameters of free will. So, you know, okay, you've been entrusted with that. We're going to give you more next time around or in this life. When you screw up and we all mess up at some point, when we mess up, we're going to be restricted somewhat in our choices. The universe is only going to let us get into so much trouble. So that the, the, the more we do things in accord with spirit, the more freedom of choice we have, the more we think, do things out of accord, the less choice we have. And, you know, I have said it all over the world. I say, you know, ultimately every single soul is going to make it. I mean, we're part of the divine. We can't be destroyed. We're, we're, we're part of the divine plan. Everyone's going to make it. Uh, and, you know, some people have gotten upset with that idea that the all loving God would set up a system where everybody makes it. But I'm convinced that's exactly what happens, that everyone's going to make it. And when I first got involved, it reminded me of a funny story. When I first got involved in this material, I was in an Edgar Casey study group. And those are ecumenical groups all over the world that discuss, you know, spirituality, how to meditate, how to work with your dreams, that kind of thing. And I was with a group of people who had been... Uh, doing this much longer than I. I was about 18 at the time and they were all in their 40s, 50s, 60s. And I said, you know, this morning I had a horrifying thought. What if every single soul in the universe has already made it except for me? And everything I'm seeing is really just for my benefit to finally help me get on the way. And one of the guys in the group closed his book and stood up. He said, guys, he finally got it. We can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that that thought was somewhat insightful in that everything that happens is for our benefit if we would just choose to see it that way. And uh, I think life's unfoldment, life's processes are there to help us to become the very best person we can be. And I like to use the phrase our best self to become our best self. Mm, I love that. I think that's true too. I think over my years as a child, I always had a hard time with um, people who did wrong things, you know, the universe still helping them, right? Yeah. But I realized, you know, the universe, God, the all that is source is here to help us, like you said, be our best selves. Like if you do something wrong, if you make a mistake or a poor choice, like Ed, the seems like the universe is just rallying to help you you know, get back on your feet, learn the lesson, maybe make different choices in the future, yeah. which I think is a really positive thing about the world, even though sometimes I'm kind of gritting my teeth that karma's not, you know, taking yeah, advantage. I, I, I think we're all, very often we all want to see more of a response to someone does something we think is wrong or someone does something that we think, boy, how can that person do that? And we want them to, you know, get theirs right then and there. But uh, it, it really doesn't work that way. There's a, a longer term plan here. And if we are eternal beings, and I believe we are, you know, 50, 60, 70 years is nothing up against eternity. And right. uh, I think our, our job really is to bring divinity spirit into the earth. That's why we're here. 
And even lots of times people in ARE will say, the Casey Organization Association for Research and Enlightenment, they'll say, you know, I hope this is my last lifetime, or I hope this is it. And, and that's really not the concept in the Casey material, that we are here until we bring divinity into the earth, until we spiritualize the third dimension. And uh, so we still got our work cut out for us. Yes, we but, do. But uh, that's, that's the job. I, I sometimes joke, you know, we are all employees for God, all of us, regardless of our background, regardless of our religious upbringing. The problem is that most of us didn't know we were hired. And even those of us who are aware of it are generally only working part time. And so uh, that's part of the reason it's just taken so long to bring this transformation about. Oh, isn't that the truth? We all have our work to do, don't we? We do. We all have our work to do. <laughs> so so look, uh, I was, I was uh, uh, the little chart behind me remind me that I, I like to talk about the Akashic Records in terms of the past, present and future. So if you'd like, I can go into that a little bit. I would love that, Kevin. Go ahead. All right. Great. So even though there's only one Akashic Record, uh, oftentimes when I talk about it, I think of it in three different components. And so the records of the past are really memory things that we've done, things that have transpired in our life. And one of the interesting, even unique approaches from Casey's perspective is that the past is only memory. And even when we use the word karma, it's not that there's any kind of debt between people or there's any kind of something that has to be, be overcome in terms of another person. The karma is only with me. My memory is my memory, not the other person's. And the, the way I have finally come to understand that is my wife and I've been together for 30 years and sometimes we'll be with a, somebody else or we'll be out somewhere and we'll be, start talking about a story that happened to us in the past. And my memory of that story is not exactly the same as my wife's. And you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, no, that's not. And we kind of have this argument about what, what really happened. And I think that's what memory is like, that we may have had a horrible encounter with another person last time around and that other person doesn't remember it that way. They have a very different perception of what went on and so in terms of karma the only person we're healing is ourself and uh, I had this experience I, I worked at ARE like you said for 39 years and I used to be a uh, director over all of our conference planning and events and very often I'd have this uh, experience where oftentimes a, a woman on a conference would come there and she'd want help with her dreams or something or want to talk about something that had gone on in her life and very often she'd have this experience where she'd talk about how she was brought up in a home where her, her parents or her father were, was verbally abusive and also always criticized her. Uh, then she went to school and she found out that other classmates and even some teacher were verbally abusive and criticized her. And then she got married and found out eventually her husband was you know, saying, I should have never married you. I could have married somebody better, criticizing her. And now she's got teenagers and they're doing the same thing. And she'll say something like, you know, I guess this is just my karma. And I usually say, you know, what the universe does is bring us something to help us learn a lesson. And karma does not mean you get to go through something again and again and again because the universe is out to get you or wants you to be a doormat. Instead, the most powerful motivator in our life is like attracts like. So in my sense is that for whatever reason, this woman as a soul had a very negative opinion of herself. You know, I'm not good enough. I'd never be able to do that. That's not really what I was meant to do. And because of that opinion, she keeps attracting to herself people who have the very same opinion with the idea that she needs to change her own awareness. And ultimately, that's all karma is. You need to change your awareness. It's not, okay, you got to do it 10 times and then you're done with it. It's you have to change your awareness. So whenever we're in a, a lesson, I usually tell myself even, I need to change my perception on this somehow and move on because this is not, doing the same thing over and over and over again is not helping me. So that's really the past. In terms of the present, uh, and this is, was a hard one for me, whatever relationships we're in right now or whatever challenges we're in right now, there's something for us to learn. And Casey would say that the Akashic Records bring our relationships and, and that the people in our life are there to help us learn about ourselves. So. Casey would say that the most challenging person in our life is showing us a reflection of the thing we need to work on in ourselves. And, you know, when I first heard that, I had a real hard time challenging that because I was working in an accounting firm and there was a woman there that drove me absolutely crazy. 
And the closest I got to it was I thought to myself, well, whatever that horrible thing is, I hope it's not as obvious in me as it is in her. But that was as good as I could do at the time. But then I had this thought, you know, even my own worst enemy has a best friend. And the reason I thought that was because the other people in the accounting firm didn't have the same frustration with this woman that I did. So even my own worst enemy has a best friend and even my best friend has someone who doesn't like them. And why is that? And it's because we're predisposed to see things in other people that can really help us learn about ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so the good side of that quality is whatever inspires you about other people, whatever really motivates you, whatever really says, wow, I wish I was more like that. The reason we're inspired by it is because it's a part of who we are and it's something we could develop in ourselves. And then in terms of the future, I got lots of stories about that, but let me just say that every choice and every decision we make right now creates a probable future. And uh, Casey would say that we're constantly dreaming about our probable futures before they happen, because to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And lots of times people say, oh, I don't dream or I never dream about my future, but we've all had this experience. And the experience is we're driving somewhere and we think, wait a minute, I've already driven to this place. I just remember this somehow. Or we're having a conversation with someone, we think, wait a minute, I've already had this conversation. And we have an experience we call deja vu, where most deja vu experiences actually are fragmentary dream recall. We dreamed about a probable future before it happened. We're going through that future. We're it's in the midst of it. We think, wait a minute, this seems so familiar. And the reason is we dreamed about it the night before. And so that's a quick overview of all these records that we're constantly interacting with that really are designed to help us to become a better person. That's fantastic. So I'm gonna to try to sort of suss out a little bit of what you okay. said about the past, present and future. And I love that our, percep our perception of experience is our memory, right? Because it really is so different for everybody in the experience. I know like my perception, if I'm dealing with something with my child, my child obviously isn't gonna you know, feel the same way or have the same yeah. memory of Absolutely. the experience. Right. And then what you said about um, that, that is our memory is our work to be done. Can you dive in a little bit more about personal experience and that memory for us and how we work with that? Sure. Uh, Cause it really I is had, experience. I had a, uh, so I'll, I'll give a personal story here. I just hope those involved don't go to YouTube and watch the show. So, <laughs> so I was raised in an extremely conservative Catholic family. I mean, extremely conservative. When I was 15 years old and I was reading the, an Edgar Casey book, my father grabbed it out of my hands and he was looking for the, I think it was called the Impromptor. It was a stamp that the Catholic Church would put in the book if you could read it. And this had been disbanded for like 40 years and my father's still looking for it. Uh, I was an altar boy for eight years. Uh, the only reason for not going to church was death, your own. I mean, you went all the time. So it was extremely conservative. And when I started reading about Casey and things, my father became very, very upset with me. And we had all kinds of arguments. And I would stand my ground and I'd argue and I'd say, you know, this is why and this is, and he couldn't see it. And we had a very challenging relationship for a number of years. And finally, two things happened that totally changed my thought process. And the first one was a dream. And the second one was an awareness when he said something. So I don't remember which was which, which went first, but here was the dream. Uh, I dreamed that I was the, at the back of the Catholic church where I was an altar boy and my parents were sitting in the front row and there was big crucifix up on top of the, in front of the altar. And as we're sitting there, all at once a movie screen came down in front of the, the cross and they started showing the Edgar Casey introductory film to the story of Edgar Casey. And I woke up and I realized the dream was saying that unless it came within the confines of the church, my father was not gonna get it because he had a whole different mindset. So that was like an aha. So no matter how careful my arguments were or how logical I tried to be about why reincarnation was so or any of the, it, 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 we were not speaking the same language. He's never going to get it. 
So that was the first thing. And the second thing was we were having an argument and I, I was just home from college uh, on a break or something. And we were, and he told me how disappointed that he was. It was bigger, stronger the word than disappointed, but disappointed that I no longer went to church when I was at college. And I started getting into my own mindset about, you didn't have to go to church. And if I did, I might go to unity or I might go to this or I might go that. I didn't have to be Catholic. And then he said, you know, if you don't go to church, when I die, speaking about him, when my father dies, he was going to be held accountable for my not remaining Catholic. And I almost thought, oh my God, he's got this horrible uh, thing on his shoulders that if all his kids don't end up Catholic, he's going to go to hell in his mind. And I felt so sorry for him to have such a small perception of God. And that changed everything. It changed everything in my mind. So between the dream and that aha, I thought, oh my God. And then life events happened and he had four kids, three of them got divorced, six grandchildren, all very different. He has mellowed tremendously over the year. But, but I was trying to give him all his training when I was 15, and it just didn't work out for either one of us. But it worked out later much better. We're, we're, we're very close now. Oh, good. Can you have another example of how, you know, you said, you know, this one about your father and then you and your wife? Do you have another example of how? Sure, I had this uh, uh, about healing a relationship. Can I use that as a, sure, I don't remember. I don't remember what exactly the uh issue was but when i was working at a country club in an office i, I always had a, i've always had a knack for accounting and a knack for writing so i'm a gemini but anyway i was in a uh, i was in this accounting office at a country club and there was a woman there who had the very same job as i did uh, only she'd been doing the kind of work for like 30 years longer and i remember the first day we met and she was introduced to me just shaking her hand i felt uneasy i mean there was definitely some kind of a connection between us from the past uh, and our relationship went down from there I mean I always felt like she was trying to catch me make a mistake and so every once in a while our desks were right next to each other every once in a while I'd be looking over at her to see if she was looking at me seeing you know what was going on and I started to feel so uncomfortable I'm not making this up our desk her desk was against the wall my desk was next to hers that I started coming into work early because you know how we all have our space if I was sitting at my desk she had to come around me to get to her desk. And that made me more comfortable than if she was sitting there and I had to go around her to get to mine. The, the manager thought I was really dedicated and coming in early and get, not getting paid for it, but it was because of this relationship. So this went on for quite some time. When she'd talk, it felt like fingernails on a blackboard and I'd cringe and I think she's trying to catch me make a mistake and I didn't like being around her. And meanwhile, at home, I'm trying to learn how to meditate. I'm uh, reading books like Love is Letting Go of Fear and all kinds of things. And I realized I had this aha when my bedroom door closed. It is so much easier to be spiritual when you're alone at home with the door closed than it is when you're at work with someone like this. So I thought, I'm gonna, I gotta change this. I gotta change this or this is gonna follow me through time somehow. And Casey's approach is to try to find something very positive in this person every single day. That's like a first step. And, you know, some days I would look at her and I think, well, her, her hair looks nice. I mean, that was like the best I, <laughs> best I could do. Her hair looks nice or her, her you know, outfit looks nice. But I told the universe, I want to work on this relationship. And one of the things I did was she often talked to anyone in particular. And I would stop and listen to her tell her story to make sure someone was listening. Uh, I would say hello to her when she walked in the morning. Good morning when she walked in. Uh, I went out of my way to try to be nice to her. Uh, she thought I was crazy. We used to, she was a smoker. And so when you would have a cigarette break in the office, I'd be reading a Casey book and she'd be smoking, you know, in, in the smoking place. But she'd see the books I was reading. And one day after seeing all these Edgar Casey books, she asked me, Kevin, do you ever read any nonfiction? Now, the more I thought about that, you know, of course, I got kind of riled up because this is what I'm really interested in. And that made me even angrier. But time went on and time passed. And I started seeing everything I could in her positive. And one day, the manager of the office said, I need two people to come in extra on weekends uh, to work on this project. And the two she picked was me and this woman. And there were seven in the office. And so it gave me a real opportunity to listen to her. And time passed. 
And I remember one day I thought I was really having a healing. And I drove home and I thought I had a healing. Well, we healed this relationship. And I went into work and I had a book with me, Dr. Ian Stevenson's 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. That was the book. And I sat on my desk and I'm thinking I'm having a healing. And this woman turns to me and she says, and I quote, why are you reading that trash? And everything I had thought positive the next day was just totally blown up. And then like five minutes later, she started talking normal to me. And I had this aha. She doesn't realize how much that hurt me. And I responded like that for no reason. So I just kept working at it and working at it. And one day we used to have this lunch table for all seven people in the office. Uh, we had been together on the weekend and Monday morning came and she sat down at lunch and she saved the chair next to her for me because she wanted to tell me something that had happened all over the weekend. And I thought, this is really fixed finally. And I, after I left that job, I went back several times and it was really hard for me to remember why I had, had such an antagonism with her, but that was definitely a healing that happened. Just by trying to focus on positive, trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, forgive myself when I was still responding and really create a new, what I did was I took away an old memory pattern of irritation, whatever the reason, and I created a new memory pattern of friendship. And I think we can do that with every one of our relationships. And what a gift from her to you to be able to work on those spots within yourself where, you know, her behavior yeah. is triggering you, right? Because those are precious moments, right? Where we can work through those yeah. triggers for ourselves. And, and I, even though she thought, I think, I think she thought I was crazy. I don't believe she was as irritated with me as I was with her. I mean, I had a special kind of irritation for her. She just was being herself. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Kevin. So how do we, um, let's dive into something to learn for us, because I know Edward Casey talks a lot about life is here as a learning experience and yeah. what we're learning from all of those. So uh, you want me to talk about how to become aware of what we're learning in the present or? Yeah, that would be great because I think that's one of the skills that has really helped me, you know, go through my life is looking at everything as a learning experience. So then I, actually, I'm probably going to tell this, you're, you're going to be up, watch, coming to an upcoming dream program I'm doing. I'm probably going to tell this story. So act surprised if you hear it again. Uh, when, when I was in my first study group, uh, they were such a interesting group of people. They did really interesting things like uh, we'd have special dinners where you could only bring what they may have had for dinner 2000 years ago, or we'd have uh, about once every six months, we'd all maybe 11 of us would work on a dream together. And the idea was you all write out a question and you go home and you dream on it several times. And when you come back, uh, you share your dream and then the group's gonna help you interpret it. That was the idea. And so the first time I ever did this, I didn't even remember if I could remember dreams. Uh, I never imagined at the time I'd go on six continents speaking about them, but I didn't know if I could remember a dream. And the group had decided to ask the question, what do I need to work on spiritually? You know, what do I, what am I supposed to be learning right now? What do I need to work on spiritually? So that was our question. And I went home and that first night I read, you're supposed to write it out. I read it over and over again before I went to bed. And I woke up the next day and I couldn't remember anything. And I became really worried that, you know, thinking all these people in this group, 10 other people are gonna have a dream and I'm not gonna have anything. And I thought, boy, I looked really stupid. I had some performance anxiety. I was really worried. So the next night I wrote it out over and over and over again. And I read it over and over and over again. And I folded it into a little square and I tuck it in my undershorts so I'd have it with me all night. That was my plan. <laughs> and I woke up and I remembered the dream. And this was the dream. Uh, I dreamed I was in Egypt and I had not up to that point been to Egypt. Uh, I've since been to Egypt six times for ARE. We do tours all over the world. Yeah. Uh, and I was in Egypt and I was on an ARE tour of some kind. And I was just coming out of the Great Pyramid. And just when I did that, there was about 50 people on this tour. And somebody in the tour group yelled really loud. I didn't see who it was, but someone yelled, oh, by the way, Jesus taught Kevin some dance steps and Kevin wants to show them to you now. And I was kind of surprised because number one, I didn't know anything about ever talking to Jesus and I sure didn't know anything about dancing, but all these people start gathering from the tour group, 50 people sitting down in front of me. And somebody I did not care for in ARE was one of those people and excuse the language, this person sat right in front of me. And as this person sat down, I thought to myself, 
what an ass as this person sat down. <laughs> and as soon as I set, thought that, I looked out over the Giza Plateau and Jesus was standing there. And Jesus thought back what I had just thought. And his next thought was, more than anything, you need to work on your thoughts. And I woke up the next day blown away. I had written out the question, what do I need to work on spiritually? And the answer was, you need to work on your thoughts. Wow. And that became a motivator, not only to try to do that, but it became a motivator for working with dreams from then on. It was just an amazing way to get an insight. And so when sometimes when people say, what do I, what, how can I find out what I need to work on? I recommend writing out the question, what do I need to work on spiritually? And see how that goes. If you're brave, you can ask your child or your spouse, what do I need to work on? <laughs> and see, see if, it, especially if they're not in the same room and they have the same consensus, that might be helpful too. But to, sometimes it's easier to get it from yourself as a start and go from there. God, that is so awesome. And I love the response, working on your thoughts. I was just thinking about that last night because I was thinking about something and then I got on the negative hamster wheel and I kept on trying to boot myself off, right? And it was like, one negative scenario after another and trying to flip the switch over and over again into, you know, stopping those negative thoughts and switching to positive thoughts. Do you have maybe a little tidbit since you've, you know, had this experience or been working on this for some time? Uh, on how to switch your thoughts? Switch? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, and I, I, you remind me though, I've had conversations with my son about, you know, sometimes when you're watching the news, it is very easy to get sucked in to what, because the, the negativity is what grabs our adrenals and that's why it's on TV. Yeah. The, except for world world news tonight right now every night on world news tonight they end with a positive story which i think is very upbeat most yeah. often it's just what's going to grab your attention but i have become very uh uh interested and an advocate of ha having like a <clears throat> little affirmation cards that you put around and the, to make you think positive thoughts uh, the Course in Miracles is great with that. Like one of them, I remember one of the Course in Miracles thoughts was, uh, I have given everything I see all of the meaning that it has for me. Meaning that, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in viewing that issue or that person or that experience with my own thoughts. And that's how I feel that way about it. But, uh, uh, you know, I sometimes have thoughts like God is in everything or uh, Lord, what would you have me do today? All these kinds of things. Actually, I can tell you a funny story about that one if you want. Uh, sure. uh, I was uh, in Virginia Beach in, in various places, especially like at the 7-Eleven. Sometimes you'll find homeless people or people asking for money. And, you know, sometimes I'm torn. Do I give money or not? Or, you know, why do, am I asking myself, what are they going to do with it? You know, that kind of thing. So every year at Christmas time, I make a deal with God. I say, God, whoever you send to me, I will give them money. No questions asked. So just whoever you want to get it, make sure you send them. And so I had just done that. I had just gotten up in the morning and thought, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? And I did my, okay, today is one of the days. Anybody you send me, I'm going to give money. And I went to work that day and I went to the bank at lunchtime and I'm in line. I was going to cash a check for $200 because we usually go to a big dinner Christmas week. And that was going to give me money for dinner for me and my family and then a little extra. So I'm standing in line to cash a check and two tellers over, there was a young man who was about, I'm going to guess 25. And the teller said to him, how are you doing today? And he said pretty loudly, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have enough money to pay the rent. And I had just told God, whoever you send, I will do something. So I wasn't quite clear. So I said in my mind, God, you're going to have to be a little more clear on this one because I'm not sure if this is mine to deal with. And I just was very sincere when I said that. I got my $200 and I turned to leave. And this young man looked straight at me. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do today because I can't pay the rent. And I followed him out to the parking lot and I gave him my envelope. And I said, I think this is for you. So I'm convinced that if you tell God that you're willing to be a channel of blessings in the earth, the divine will be there. I mean, how do you think God impacts things in the material world? And very often it's through us that we are all supposed to be channels of divine energy. And that's, you know, if we look for opportunities, we'll find.
Wow, that's amazing, Kevin. Let's dive into that a little bit more, that okay. we're all channels for the divine as far as like synchronicity and coincidence and intuition and stuff like that. So Akashic Records and our intuition and God, you know, co-creating like, through us. Let's dive into that. Okay. So I think that uh, because our, our nature is spirit, and because we're not limited to our physical bodies, it is very possible to have all kinds of intuitive experiences. In fact, I do this program every once in a while. It's basically five programs teaching people how to uh, get more into their intuition. But you can get insights into when somebody might need your help. Uh, sometimes the best psychic ability is knowing when not to say something or to tell someone you had this experience or whatever, and just be a listening ear. But I think that if you're open to the idea and you're not worried about what someone's going to say, or you're not worried about whether or not you're going to have another $200 to buy the dinner, I used a credit card that night. <laughs> you, just, you just go with it. And I think the universe will give you more and more opportunities to be of service. And then when you need something yourself or want insights, it's easier to get. So I just thought of another story. There was an occasion before I became in charge of conferences, I was actually uh, a person who coordinated, this is maybe when I was 24 or something, I coordinated our programs in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and ARE does conferences year round at their conference center in Virginia Beach. And they also do conferences throughout the country. And there was a woman named Peggy who had that job and I had the Virginia Beach job. And our director over us gave her notice. And I wanted that job. And I thought, you know, I could do that job. And so I applied for it and I went through all kinds of interviews and we went through all kinds of things and I felt really good about my chances. And one night I had a dream and in the dream, I'm in Charles Thomas Casey. He was the president at the time, Charles Thomas Casey's office. And he had, there was the table of organization on his desk and I could see my boss, the director, and I could see me and Peggy right there. And I could see I wanted that job. And Charles Thomas took a black magic marker and he crossed out to the director of conferences position and he took extra lines and he actually had Peggy and I reporting to two other directors and thereby saving a salary of the director. <laughs> so I knew ahead of time that that was what was going to happen and it really did. Now, about three years later, I ended up getting that job anyway, but it was just an interesting way to tune into something before it happened and get insights about it. But I have found over and over, I was with uh, uh, I was in Japan, I've been there three times, and there was a woman who was having a uh, problem that she wanted me to help her with, but she didn't want me to tell her what the problem was. And she didn't speak English. I had a translator, where she didn't speak English. So I said, write out your question in Japanese, you know, kind of, I guess they call it kanji or something. And she wrote out, and I can't read that. So she wrote it out to me and I held it next to me all night and I had a dream about my own life. And uh, I came back the next day and I said, this is the dream I had and this is what it meant to me. And she started crying because it answered her question because wow. it was about a relationship she's having. And that reminds me of another story I had of a relationship. I had a fiance uh, who I broke up with horribly when I moved to Virginia Beach. Uh, wonderful girl. And we just had this argument. Don't even remember who started it, but it was one of those you don't, you're too embarrassed about it. You're not going to speak about it. And I moved to Virginia Beach and we didn't speak after that. And I started having dreams about her. And I was dreaming about her every night. And I was so embarrassed about what had happened that I didn't feel comfortable calling. So I started praying for her. Every night before I went to bed, I'd imagine her and I'd pray for her. And I'd pray for her. Mm -hmm. And I did that every night for about a week. And then one day I'm in my office at work and the phone rings and I pick it up. And she says, hi, Kevin, it's Mary. And it was my old fiance. And she said, I have this horrible problem and you're the only person I can think of that can help me. And it was amazing because she worked for the airline. So she came to Virginia Beach and we talked through her problem and she felt like she got some help. And then we talked through what had happened and we kind of forgave each other and moved on with it. But it was just an amazing uh, experience to see how even if you just give it a little bit of attention, how you can heal something from the past, if you're open to it. 
That's amazing, Kevin, and a beautiful story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So it sounds like, as far as the Akashic Records goes, we're in constant contact. We're in constant contact with each other. We're in constant contact with our own strengths and weaknesses. We're in constant contact with the probable future we're creating. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to make it a little more complicated here in a minute. Casey would say there's no such thing as time. This is all an illusion. Time is an illusion. So I actually have this lecture I give on the illusion of time, which makes it much more complicated. But it, it is and very interesting when you start to look at some of these concepts and how uh, you can not only change your life, but you can help other people, how you can become more aware. Uh, it just changes your whole perception on the world. And what's going on and how this is a learning experience for me. And unfortunately, I, I sometimes joke with my wife, you know, uh, I'd rather tell her what she needs to work on than trying to figure out what I need to work on. But that's really why we're all here to try to figure out what we're supposed to be working on. So how can we tap into the Akashic Records and work with it and to benefit our lives? Well, what, one of my pet peeves is when I hear psychics saying uh, that they use the Akashic Records because if you're doing something psychic, there is no other source of information. We are all using the Akashic Records. And in fact, we are constantly tuning into the Akashic Records at all times. We just don't know that that's what we're doing. But the experience we have is we meet someone for the very first time and we don't like that person, or we meet someone for the very first time and we have this total unconditional love for this person. And where does that come from? And it's we pick up these relationships with one another exactly where we left them off. And so I think that just in terms of our interactions through the day, very often we can see what it is we're, we're working on. We meet someone and, okay, why don't I like this, this person? What am I supposed to be learning from that? And or, or what am I seeing in this person that can give me insights and some of my own strengths that I can work on right now? So I, I think it's just becoming more observant with what's going on around you. And I truly have found that the more you work with your intuition, the more you work with being open to what the universe is trying to send you, the easier it becomes. And you can get all kinds of insights and guidance. And whether it's you find your knack as dreams or you find it uh, might be something else, intuition or tarot or astrology or whatever it might be, I think we're wired for guidance if we're the least bit open to it. Yeah, I feel the same way too. That once you have the awareness and you're open to it, it is, it becomes like a magical life, I like to say, where it's yeah. just there. It just yeah. is. Can yeah. you talk about that a little bit more, how people can, you know, bring more of that awareness into their lives? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a fond one of, uh, of often asking, I think I've mentioned this, you know, what would you have me do today to the divine or asking the question, uh, what am I supposed to be learning from this? And generally what, what I'm supposed to be learning is not to get angrier or to hold a grudge or to become madder. What, what else, what is this trying to, to teach me? And, you know, when I told this story about the woman at the uh, country club that had driven me crazy, when time passed and I had reflection to think about it, I thought of two previous jobs I had had where there was a similar character at that company. And it was almost like this issue, whatever it was, was following me. So I think if we look at our lives and we say, okay, th what, what keeps happening in my life? What one thing keeps happening? And if we can get a handle on that, we might get insights into what we're supposed to be learning. But I think the, the downside is we, we need to remind ourselves, it's not happening because the universe is mad at me or somehow I really screwed up. It's happening because I'm supposed to change my awareness somehow. And, and that's really, you know, this is a lecture in itself, but karma and grace are both exactly the same in terms of what they work with. It's a change of awareness. So karma is, if, if in a past life I kicked somebody 10 times and then this lifetime they're going to kick me back 10 times, as soon as the awareness hits me, you know what? It's not nice to kick somebody. It, it's not helpful. It doesn't do anything. If I get that awareness, I don't have to go through the karma. It's also possible to watch somebody else go through that and think, oh my God, how horrible that someone would kick another person. And through grace, I have the awareness without having to go through the experience. So both karma and grace are about changing our awareness to become better people. Wow. And that really is true to like when you experience something or 
And then you see someone else years later, they're experiencing the same thing, even though that's your overlaying what your experience was or assuming that their experience of getting it is your experience of getting it right. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, like absolutely. When um, say, I'm just going to do something basic. Like I'll go back to our early twenties when we're all dating. Right. And you break up with someone and then someone breaks up with you. Like first they got to experience, you know, those emotions of abandonment and loss. Right. And then eventually you'll get to experience those too. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's like a yeah. basic explanation. Right. Yeah. And how that can play out. And what did we learn from that experience? And then the compassion we could probably learn from, oh, this person experienced that too. Then it softens our heart and opens up compassion you yeah. know, for the person who is experiencing those experiences or whatever happens in life, you know, because there's a variety <laughs> here on planet yeah. earth of experience we used to have, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's one really, at least in my own experience, having children was very really helpful at trying to build compassion for someone smaller than yourself, less capable than yourself, someone who doesn't have any choices, because sometimes you feel so hopeless as a parent and all you can do is feel the empathy and compassion. When somebody's had a bad time with friends or they felt like someone bullied on them or whatever it is that, you know, you, you start to think, oh, my gosh, you know, all you can be is a comforting ear and just listen sometimes. Right. And actually, my wife was extremely helpful with that. Uh, I'm very left brain and I like to get to the solution very quickly. And so she'd have a problem and I try to help her with it. And the way she explained it to me, she said, if I was a little child and I cut my finger I want you to hold little finger. I want you to wipe it off. I want you to blow on it. I want you to kiss it and then put the Band-Aid on. All you want to do is you just want to put the Band-Aid on. And so that was like a great, oh my gosh, yeah, that's exactly what I do. So let's uh, do the other first. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I also want to um, go back to the woman um, that in the story that you were talking about early where she kept on having experiences where criticism was coming into her life or abusive behavior or being a doormat or something like that. So how can we like look at these situations and go, okay, I don't want to invite these things back in my life anymore, but how do we actually like change, change ourselves to not have these experiences anymore? So with, with, with examples like that, what I, often, what I generally told the people was, I want you every morning to get up and I would recommend the affirmations or some kind of card, say something good about yourself. Boy, you look really great today. Or boy, you're, you know, you're really prepared for this and constantly give yourself positive reinforcement. And the more you can do that and really mean it, you know, come up with something little and then build, you're going to attract to you other people who say the very same thing. You know, wow, you really did a great job. Uh, I, I used to have this, uh, I wanted to feel good about work. So oftentimes when I was uh, working in this conference job, when they switched me to another director, I used to say, oh, that was a very good job. Or I'd do a flyer. That was a great flyer. And that was really good. And I was always, <laughs> finally, one day I asked my boss, I said, how come you never give me a compliment? And he said, well, you're always so busy complimenting yourself. I never have a chance. So <laughs> I thought maybe I took it to a little extreme there. But anyway, uh, that was a funny experience. <laughs> I love that. So, and then how can we tap into the Akashic Records on a daily basis? What are some practices that you do personally, besides the couple examples that you've already given, where we can invite that into our lives more fully? So one thing you can do is, you know, in addition to looking at people that come into your life, uh, sometimes when my wife and I have, have our board or we, we, we have a question in life, what we do is we play a psychic game that I think taps into the Akashic Records. And basically what we do, well, let me have a play it by yourself and then play it with another person. What I do is, let's say I have a question that I really want to know the answer to. I, I write out that question. The problem is that one of the things that stands in the way of our intuition is our conscious wants, desires, fears, all those kinds of things. And so you have to come up with a way to bypass all of those conscious fears or desires. And what I do is if I have a question, I write out two other questions, equal questions. And I usually put them on an index card. So I have three index cards, three questions. I turn them all over and I mix them all up. And then I clear my mind. Try to think of nothing. Just clear your mind. And then you set your hand on one of the cards and you imagine something. And it doesn't even matter what. You imagine 
a person, you imagine a movie, you imagine opening a book, you imagine going to a place, it doesn't matter. Just imagine something. And as soon as something comes to mind and you get a clear sense of what it is, write on the card what you just saw and set it aside and do the other two cards. And basically without looking at them, you do, and it can be the same thing, a person, a person, a person, there could be a person, a book, a movie, and you do all three cards. And basically what's happening is your hand is tuning into the energy of that question and your higher self is actually going to the Akashic Records and picking up on the symbolism that's gonna answer those questions. And when you're done, you turn over all the questions and you would be amazed at how often you get insights to a question you're having, but something that simple. When I play with my wife, when we're doing it together, basically we have a piece of paper and we each write a question and we fold up the piece of paper and then we mix it up so we don't know whose question is whose. And we do the same thing. She holds one side and I, I hold the other one and we, she'll say, okay, see a book or whatever. We change cards. We do the same thing, see a movie. We open the pieces of paper and we interpret what we saw in terms of the question. And you would be amazed how often intuition works. It's just, it's amazing. So that's one easy way to access information from the Akashic Records. I love that. Is there a process that you could possibly guide us through it, so our listeners mean, can have an experience? You mean like right now? Mm -hmm. Like maybe do a meditation for everyone or a guided journey or something okay. like that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm a little worried people will be driving and closing their eyes, but uh, setting that aside. <laughs> well, they can always listen to the recording or they pause it. The and then when they get later, home yeah. and in a comfortable chair or yeah. lying down, then yeah, yeah, please, if you're using heavy machinery or driving, um, press pause and then pick up this part later. <laughs> How about that? Okay. So what, what, I, what I'd like them to consider doing is if everyone would just get a piece of paper and sign their name on that piece of paper. So it doesn't matter uh, just anywhere on the piece of paper. The piece of paper can be as big or as small as you want. And I want you to just sign your name. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to breathe. Breathe in relaxation all the way through your body. And breathe out any tension. We're gonna do this three times. Just breathe in relaxation all the way through your body. And breathe out any tension. And as you're breathing, I want you to put your hands on this piece of paper or hold on to this piece of paper that you just signed and keep your eyes closed. And again, breathe in relaxation, breathe out any tension. And I want you to feel the energy of this piece of paper. And in your imagination, I want you to see a book, a book of any kind. It can be one that exists or one that you're making up. I want you to see a book. This book has a story to tell. What is it? And with your eyes still closed, I want you to imagine opening this book to a section, anywhere in the book. What is this scene all about? What can you learn from this scene and this part of the story? And next, I want you to turn the book to the place that talks about the most challenging character in that book. Who is this challenging character? And how do you feel about this person? And finally, one more time, turn the book to another section where this, the most wonderful character is described. most wonderful character. Who is this wonderful character and how do you feel about this person? And when you have those four things, a book, opening the book to a section, opening the book to the place where there's a challenging character, 
and opening the book to a place where there's a wonderful character, you can open your eyes. And on your piece of paper, I just want you to jot down quickly what the name of the book or what kind of book it was, what the section was all about. What are one or two problems with the challenging character and perhaps one or two qualities of the wonderful character? I'll just give you a minute to do that. And I had quickly on a piece of paper here on my desk, I had written down what you were really tuning into. And if Edgar Casey's right, you knew what you were tuning into. So you had a piece of paper that you had your own set or your signature on it. I wanted you to see a book that symbolized your life story. So what, you know, whatever book you saw, somehow that's a symbol of your life story. When you open the book to a section, I wanted you to see a personal message for you at this time. What kind of personal message would be helpful at you at this time? And then the challenging character, I wanted you to see a symbol of something you needed to work on. And the wonderful character, I want you to see a symbol of your greatest strengths and talents at this time. And that's hopefully what everyone tuned into and we'll go from there. That was fantastic. What a great experience to lead everybody through. And it's it's true. I definitely like saw like the life of Liz and then the personal message was something around my work, which I've been asking about recently. And the symbol of something I needed to work on was maybe, you know, some frustrations that I have for other that I could in turn work on myself. And yeah. then um, the, what was the last, it was gifts, right? The gifts right. that you have that, that you're gifts, giving yeah. to the world. And like, totally, when you said that, like seeing the gifts in this person that I would like to have for myself. That's a beautiful experience. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. So um, what is something that we may not have discussed that you would like to share with the Akashic Records that uh, we may not have um, chatted about yet? Well, I, I think that the Akashic Records are there to help us become our best self. And I think that as long as we can hold in mind that the universe is on my side and generally our biggest challenge is ourself, not the universe. Our biggest challenge is ourself, not other people. That we really have the potential in this lifetime to make a lot of progress uh, on our own soul growth and development. And it's really as we develop that we're gonna help transform the world. Uh, somebody, <laughs> I remember once in a program, someone asked me, you know, how much longer do we have to keep doing this? And I said, I want you to think of the dumbest person you know, until that person has made it, we're still gonna keep doing this. You know, we're gonna keep doing this over and over and over again until we bring spirit into the earth and transform the consciousness of everyone. So uh, I, as I mentioned earlier to you, or on before we start, I'm gonna be on several programs for journeywithin.com, uh, one word journeywithin.com over the next few months if anyone wants to see me again. That's great. And I've had the pleasure of, you know, watching one. I'm looking forward to the one about dreams that's coming up next Saturday. And you have a couple more, I think you said once a month, you're going to yeah. be doing work with them, which is great. And then people can find you on um, kevintodeshi.com. And what do you have to offer there, Kevin? Well, the, there's a, a list of all my books at kevintodeshi.com. And if they want to find out more about Edgar Casey, they can go to edgarcasey.org, one word, edgarcasey.org, find out more about Mr. Casey. And ARE has a lot of great information. I've been doing incredible being resources. Yeah. That's fantastic. Great resources. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Is there a jewel of wisdom that you would like to leave us with today? I would say that if you can think of about the one person you love most of all in the whole wide world and how you feel about that person and get some inkling, some understanding, some semblance of truth that God loves you even more than that. I think that can go a long way to supporting us when we feel kind of depressed or down. That's beautiful, especially these days, right? Even though Absolutely. we feel like we're kind of coming out of what's been going on for the last couple of years, there's still lingering things that we're all dealing with. And I think that's beautiful. Thanks, Kevin, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the program. Thanks, thanks for joining me. It's been a pleasure to have you. You're welcome.
Thanks. And thank you everyone for joining us. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and this is Raise the Vibe with Liz. You can find me at Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Raise the Vibe with Liz. And my website is Liz's Healing Touch. Dot com. Thanks everybody for joining us and remember to get out there and raise the vibe. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.